welcome everyone to episode 89 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and I just want to say thank you for checking us out. If you like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It'll help us bring more interviews, and it'll just keep the show rolling. So we're going to talk to another arcade in Canada. It's been a little while since we've spoken to anybody in Canada. Um, we've got Steve, the owner of Quasar's Arcade, and it seems like a whole bunch of other ones that we'll get into in Victoria, British Columbia. How are you doing today, Steve? Really good, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we we got you on. We've been talking for feels like a month now, kind of going back and forth. I got some footage of the arcade, got to check it out, and now I get to ask you some questions to find out what's up with the arcade. Um, so first off, just go ahead and introduce yourself. Let everybody know a little bit about who Steve is. Uh, my name is Steve Webb. So I operate Quasar's Arcade in Victoria, BC. Uh, also the Gamma Room, which is a private party room. Uh, we're at the Powerhouse Pinball Club is another one of our uh, properties. Um, so yeah, we do quite a lot for pinball and arcade amusements here on the west coast of Canada. Awesome, yeah, I've, I've only spoken to one other arcade in Canada, so it's, it's cool to see kind of how the scene is a little bit different up north. I mean, I'm really not that far away from you, but um, up north from, from the US, just to see how it goes. Let's, let's start with you. Where did the addiction or collection, whatever you wanna call it, begin with the arcades? And when did you, where did it start? Like, what was the first arcade? Was it Quasars or was it a different one? Uh, yeah, it was Quasars. Um, we started that about three and a half years ago. Uh, my business partner there is my brother. Um, I've been involved, um, I guess, in collecting arcade machines. I'm a bit of a collector. Um, I really enjoy finding things, uh, fixing them up. Um, I like showing off uh, collected things. So, um, I know there's a lot of collectors in this area, a lot of collectors in general that don't um, let people play their arcades and their pinball machines, but I, I feel very strongly that that stuff needs to be enjoyed uh, in order for it to be truly useful. Um, so, yeah, I started collecting arcade machines, I guess, about, say, eight or nine years ago. Um, you could get them for so cheap. God, it hurts me just thinking about how cheap those machines were. Um, you know, hundred bucks, go buy yourself an arcade machine. Uh, so I got a few of those and I kept them. Um, my other business is uh, I do commercial print. I've been involved in that for about 20 years. Um, co arcade collecting has always been kind of a hobby of mine, um, in the way that I would collect them and then just sort of keep them around the, the various locations that we had and, uh, mess around with them, try to get them working. Um, and then I started thinking, um, after once you hit four or five machines start thinking man it'd be great to get a couple more and then get a bunch of people in and see if we can recreate that kind of classic arcade feel that i grew up with that i i think that i miss so much you know so that's kind of what we're doing up here yeah and you like you said you've got multiple locations you've got kind of different business models when you first started quasars like the idea was in your head you had collected a couple cabinets what was that process like going from the cabinets in your collection to actually having the arcade open and then what business model did you go with as opposed to like did you go with coins did you go with like a membership what was your move there um i wanted to do uh tokens i wanted to do coin drop and i wanted to do tokens because um i think that classic arcade you go you go in and you buy you know you got your coins and you go to the machine and you, you have the little token that's got the arcade's name on it and um it also uh, it also kind of made sense for us for, um, to us from a um, financial standpoint, um, and I also really wanted to uh, have our a token kind of out there in the world. And, and I mean, it's amazing the amount of tokens that we go through. I think we've made I don't know. I think there's probably eighty thousand tokens out there or something that we've made and put out into the world. So um, that's kind of neat thinking that somebody will come across that in a couple of years. And I mean, we mail them out to collectors. I just mailed a bunch to this guy in Australia that has this uh, Instagram page where he collects tokens. Kind of neat. Um, so yeah, we went with a coin drop uh, token model, um, and we went with an all ages arcade. Uh, that was important to us at the beginning, um, partially because uh, getting a liquor license in uh, where we are, British Columbia is incredibly difficult. They make it uh, so challenging um, that it's almost not even worth pursuing. Um, and I mean, that's, you know, we, we have an all ages arcade and people come down there all the time and they walk in, they go, you guys should get beer. 
like it had never occurred to us that we should sell beer. But it's such a, uh, yeah, it, it, it's so challenging to do that. I mean, I could go on for hours about why that business model is, uh, is tough. So to a certain degree, our hands were tied in that regard. So um, we went with the All Ages Arcade and we wanted to do something um, that was very clean and, and really focused on some of those really uh, essential games from, you know, the, the time when I was uh, in arcades in the, you know, the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was sort of how the whole thing came to fruition. I had another, uh, I had another business partner at one point. So, um, at the outset, there was a little bit more money around. So, um, you know, we switched very quickly into trying to acquire as many games as we could kind of feeling this pressure that a lot of these games were getting snapped up by, um, other people sort of trying to open, uh, barcades and stuff in this, in this area. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you guys went with a cool model, and I love the coin idea. I mean, you have to—I don't remember who I was talking to, but it's like you have this coin in your hand, and you have this this time. So you're basically—it's an opportunity cost of like which game am I going to invest this coin into, and it it just it feels different than paying at the door and being able to play as much as you want unlimited because you know it's it, you, you're investing something into that game. Yeah, and you have primarily like classic games. You've got pinballs, stuff like that. And since you're doing coins, I'm curious if you know what some of your highest grossing games are for people that are interested in starting arcades around the world. Shooters. People love to shoot things. Uh, Terminator Salvation, I think, is our biggest earner. Um, yeah, if you have a gun game, like put it, in your, put it right in your front door. Let people connect it. Let them see it with their eyes. And get their, start doing this with their hands, and then they get in there and they... They'll just load that thing with, with money. It's wild. Um, the classic games uh, that you need, um, you know, you need a Galaga and you need your Donkey Kong. You got to have, you know, those ones. You need Miss Pac-Man. You got to have a couple of, there's a few games where people, they, they want to just see them, you know, and they come down the stairs. They're like, oh, look, it's an arcade. Go, Is it an arcade? Go, Do they have a Galaga? <laughs> Where's the Street Fighter 2? So, um, yeah, shooting games, driving games, um, you know, things that, uh, yeah, people can climb into. They love that. Um, we, you know, we're in an interesting crossroads because we're down a flight of stairs at our, uh, at our main location at Quasar. Um, that's going to change uh, very soon, but we haven't announced that to anybody yet. Right, Jules? That's right. Can we? Got to have uh, good people around like Jules there. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we got some interesting things happening, uh, in the future for us. And, um, I want to get into some of the more, the newer, uh, bigger arcade machines that, you know, the, the new sort of generation of, of arcades We'd like to like to see some, uh, some of those things in there. That's next. Yeah. It's, it's always the plan is to grow and expand. And obviously you've done that with three locations now, um, with the one you're at, the pinball one, which is membership exclusive, I thought that was a really cool idea. Um, tell us a little bit more about that business. Uh, so an interesting thing happened during the pandemic, um, which was uh, we shut down. We were actually closed to the public for 15 months. The model that we used to survive was um, we switched to a rental model. At that point, I mean, the... Um, the mandates, uh, you know, the public health orders that we had here in British Columbia, where you had to stay uh, initially in, 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 in small groups of, of an undefined number. So um, we allowed people to, to rent the arcade at groups of 20 uh, for an hour, and then we disinfect every single contact surface in the whole arcade. It was brutal. Um, we, <laughs> and then they passed the, the, the new public health order that said you only have six people in your immediate family uh, or bubble, they called it. So we switched to a bubble booking model and we rented that arcade, that two and a half thousand square foot arcade to, for six people at a time. And we did that for, yeah. so, um, that was tough, but you know, you do what you can. Gotta um, survive. Yeah. Now, so what, interestingly enough, during that whole time, like not a single person called me and said, I really need to play tap. Uh, you know, it just wasn't, it's not like a, a life or death thing to play uh, a stand-up arcade machine, you know? However, pinball. 
um, people just wanted to play a pinball machine so bad. And they didn't want to rent the whole arcade. They just wanted to play one game of pinball. So we got the idea for this, uh, the Powerhouse Pinball Club. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm involved in commercial print, so I have this massive uh, warehouse that was sitting empty. So we put a bunch of pinball machines and we put them six feet away. Uh, so it fit with the current public health orders at the time, which is no one would, was within six feet of each other. And people would come down and play masks and we had sanitation stations everywhere. And, and that's how um, we played pinball the entire way through the pandemic. Uh, and because it was something that we'd figured out that we could do and we, we were saying, hey, this is a thing that like you can do and it's safe. And um, uh, we, we, like, we had like 700 members in this club. It was wild. So then we moved the clubhouse over here when we didn't have to put the machines six feet apart. And uh, now we operate this. And um, this pinball thing has taken on an entire life of its own. It's a different, um, yeah, it has different... Uh, clientele to a degree um you know we have a lot of we do a lot of private parties and team building stuff here corporate events um people just love the free play model when it comes to pinball because it doesn't have um it doesn't have the barrier of the coin draw um i think that it, it's different in every single area when it comes down to um people's general feelings about pinball i mean there's some very Seattle, Portland, those are pinball towns, right? You can walk into uh, um, a bar and you go, oh, well, there's the pinball machines. I mean, they're always here, right? It's, you go to the laundromat and there's a pinball machine there. So um, that type of infrastructure where people are familiar with seeing the machines and they identify with them and they feel comfortable walking up and tapping their card. I mean, um, what, what we know now from what we've done over the last couple of years is that um, that doesn't just happen. You know, you have to build uh you have to build up a clientele you have to expose people to pinball you can't just put a pinball machine there and assume that everybody's going to understand how it works if you have a town that doesn't have a history of pinball um so the powerhouse pinball club and powerhouse pinball as as a company what we try to do is expose people to new or well-maintained functioning pinball machines because i have a theory that out of every 10 people that you put in front of a pinball machine i mean two or three of them are really going to enjoy it provided that it works the way it should and they're in a comfortable and safe environment to do it um and turning victoria into a pinball town which is essentially what we're trying to do here we understand that it's going to take a long time years years um and so we're committed to doing that so that's what we're doing I love it. The idea of expanding out and I've, I've loved it, arcade games for a long time now and developed a game myself. And I just really got into pinball recently and absolutely love it. So I, I get that. Um, let's, let's talk games. You've got a history in games, you own games. What are your top five arcade games of all time in your personal opinion? Um, that's a good question. And I, you'd think it would be one that I would have prepared for given the, uh, nature of this interview that let me think uh, i didn't so uh tempest i love tempest um I, like those atari vector games man they still hold up they still look great you know i like me a battle zone tempest major havoc those are real nice um you know i like r type some of those uh, i really like r type in a, a classic uh, arcade format um let's see uh you know what I do like a lot of Atari games. Gauntlet uh, is up there for me, mostly because of the memories. And, you know, it, it's funny when you when you think about um, like when I worked the counter at Quasars. Uh, I, I don't get to work there as much as I, I'd like to, or I probably should. But um, it always amazes me what people come down and identify as their favorite game. But of course, they don't say their favorite game. They say that's the best game ever made. Um, and it's the, it's more often than not, it's the game that they played. It was the one that they were exposed to. Um, and I find that having some of those weird uh, games in your arcade, it leads to, to some really interesting <laughs> stories. The people love to come down the, the stairs and they, they do the look around and they see the game, they come over and they, you know, put their $5 down and they tell you the story about 
you know, that, that was down the street from where their uncle lived and they mom would give them five bucks and they'd go down and put it into that game. It's the best game ever made and it's bank panic. <laughs> it's like, well, it's not the best game ever made, but I, I appreciate that we hit that nostalgia nerve for you. Yeah. I mean, that's so true. Like I absolutely love area 51 because it was at the arcade at the mall where I used to go to movies all the time when I was in middle school. And that's like my favorite shooter period. Like if there's an area 51, like that's the first game I'm going to. So I totally understand that. And it, it seems like it'd be cool to have such a wide array of different games that people say is the best game ever made or their favorite game. And that's one really cool thing you get with running an arcade. You have a big collection. You're obviously starting to collect pinball and everything. What is your holy grail? Like if this game came up on auction or whatever, price does not matter and you could snatch it up, what game would it be? I got to hit uh, you with the tough ones. Yeah. Well, again, that shouldn't be tough. You'd think as an arcade owner that I would have that on the tip. I've been very lucky in that, in that, you know, we got a lot of the machines that I really thought, um, yeah, you know, I had, I had one and I, I'm, I'm kicking myself cause I sold, I had one of those highway pinball alien, uh, machines I had it in my possession and I sold it. Uh, cause I, we couldn't, couldn't get it, had it and something that we just couldn't trace it down. There was a ghost in it and I wish I had that one back. Um, let me see. Uh, it, it would probably have to be a pinball machine now. Um, I think I would really like to have, uh, I would like to have a Tales, uh, a, um, Tales of the, of the Arabian Night, uh, the pinball machine, the Williams, uh, that'd be pretty cool. Um, for arcade, I don't have a major Havoc. I think I'd like to have one of those. Um, I think that's a very underrated game, um, uh, but super hard to find. Um, you know, but like I wanted, I really wanted a Star Wars cockpit and then I, you know, I got one of those. I really wanted a, a Robotron uh, cocktail and I got one of those. So dreams do come true. Yeah, I mean, that Star Wars cockpit is, that's one that I really love. And there's an arcade near me that has one. And I went straight to that one the last time I was in there because it, you don't see it a lot. It's, it's not a super, super common game to find in an arcade. Like collectors have them and they keep yeah. them at home. Like you were saying, they don't let people play them. So that's definitely a good one to find but yeah i mean those are obviously great selections um and then you have one other arcade that we haven't talked about right uh well it's more of a so we have a private party room uh called the gamma room uh and that is we actually it's beside the quasars uh what we learned from the pandemic by renting out uh the arcade again that whole model of the pay just pay for the room and then have your, uh, you know, let the, the kids go wild and eat cake and do that thing. I mean, that was, um, that was a market that was completely underserved. So it made so much sense that we decided to dedicate a portion of our floor space to it. Um, and then we purpose built a room and put a jukebox in it uh, and put, I don't know, there's 15 or 20 machines in there on free play. And they people rent it out by the hour. I think it was a two hour span. And just, you know, the kids just do they there's a house of the dead in there and a couple pinball machines. And and um, yeah, so that that model, I think, I think having that, you know, the pinball club, the coin drop arcade. Uh, we had another location, unfortunately, that we just closed down um, that we called the pinball substation. And uh, it was, I think, maybe just a little bit too ambitious. Uh, it was. Uh, we, we got six of the nicest pinball machines that we could get our hands on, like brand new ones. There was a, a Rick and Morty in there, and we had a Guns N' Roses and uh, a couple of the new Sterns. Uh, we hooked them up with the Scorbit uh, scoring and pin stadium lights and shaker motors. And we uh, put them in a beautiful room, sort of attached to a coffee shop on like the busiest corner in town and put live play field monitors above. Uh, just really went all out and tried to show people what pinball like was in... 2021, I guess, when we built it, uh, saying, you know, this is what, what pinball looks like in the modern age. You know, you want to see how far it's come. Uh, this is what it is. And, we, you know, the, they could go up and tap their card and, and, and play the machines. And it just, um, I think it was maybe too soon after COVID. And also, I just don't think that we were quite where we need to be uh, on that, um, you know, pinball town. 
uh, level. We, we weren't, Victoria's just not quite there yet to support something like that. So, um, you know, learned a hard lesson there, uh, lost uh, a bit of ground, um, you know, but at the same time, a lot of people, the, they were on there in the window for eight months and people walked by and saw them and said, oh, look at that. I didn't even know they made pinball. You know, and so at least they thought about pinball. <laughs> we'll get them next time. Right. I mean, you can't see it as a total failure because you obviously learned something. I love yeah. that you had a, a spooky pinball, a, a Jersey Jacks, and uh, some Stern stuff in there. I just spoke with Jack, what, a week ago or two weeks ago? I saw that. That was awesome. And yeah. that Guns N' Roses cabinet is sweet. So that was a, a really Very good cool. trick there. Yeah. Um, I guess the last question I have for you, Steve, as someone who obviously is running three arcades, has tried other things, what advice would you give to someone that is now trying to start up their own arcade bar? And you, you've seen the hurdles, you've seen the problems you run into. What advice would you give them to kind of get over that initial hump and make it a little bit easier? Um, I would say pay attention to you, what your customers are saying to you. It's, it's very easy to become precious about our collections because in a lot of cases, um, People who open arcade bars are finding a way to, um, you know, monetize their collections or invite people into their little world. Um, and you have to understand what it is that, uh, that they want. Um, and the games that you love, sometimes, you know, I mean, Dragon's Lair is one of the coolest, you know, it, it was so mind-blowing when it came out. And, and uh, I spent so much money on a Dragon's Lair. <laughs> You know, and I was so convinced that it was just going to, no one wants to play Dragon's Lair, man. It's hard. <laughs> no it's to... a hard game. They don't get it. They don't get it. They're like, I played the, I watched the cartoon and then <laughs> I don't know what, like, what's it supposed to do? So yeah, listen to what people tell you and remember, you know, that you're, what you're trying to do is create a, an experience. Uh, for people and you know it's it's not um it's not not the same for for everybody and 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 you, you know again you got to be you have to be prepared to kind of share uh there were a lot of games that i had that were in the back room that i i had i'm not ever putting that out you know i'm not gonna let anybody touch that machine and now they're all out there on the floor <laughs> because what like yeah it's not for me you know they didn't make Valley didn't make that shadow for me. You know, I'm just the guy that, that I'm, I'm the curator of this collection right now. And, and, um, you know, and by doing that, you, you give something, something, put something fun back into your community. It's, it's a great feeling. That's why we're doing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're all here to have fun. So, I mean, they're games. You've got, These are right, games. they're meant to be played period. That's yeah. what they're for. Um, yeah. That's great advice. I think people get so stuck in this is the best game, like we were talking about, the best game ever made. In your opinion, someone else may love it. Someone else may not love it. So share it, let them play it, and build that atmosphere, that ambiance that everybody wants to come back and get that nostalgic fix. And that's what the arcades are for. So I guess to wrap everything up, Steve, just give shout outs to your social media so people can follow along on your journey. Uh, yeah, we're at uh, quasarsarcade.com, uh, and that's also our Instagram handle, powerhousepinball.com. Uh, same thing, at powerhousepinball. Uh, you can check those out. Keep an eye on our, if you join our mailing list, we got a big announcement coming up for all of our properties. And uh, we're going to take another uh, big swing here uh, in the fall. So I'm real excited to see what, what's, uh, what's going to happen and how the community is going to respond to our next big project. Awesome. Well, I'm going to throw all those links down in the description so you guys can check them out. I'm super glad to hear that you guys have plans moving forward and everything is continuing to move for you. Um, and I just, again, thank you, Steve, for coming on and chatting with us. If you guys are still watching, uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It means the world to us. It helps us continue to grow. And until next time, peace.